on. Who knows? It's 139. Christ the Lord is risen today. <coughs> Who knows this one? Oh, not many. This will be interesting. You might know the Alleluia part, but the rest, that's okay. Follow along. Listen. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. We'll work it out. 139. All four verses. If you don't know it, you'll not see it. Yes, by the end you'll pick it up. All right. It's reasonably fast. First. Christ the Lord is risen today. saved? That's what that song's all about. Hallelujah. Who knows what hallelujah means? Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. Praise our God. Does anyone know the sign language for praise the Lord? That's sign language. Praise the Lord. So that's what hallelujah means. So anytime you're singing something, praise is, you know what's incorporated in praise? Your hands and clapping and praising. So, anyway, it's a good thought. It's not Pentecostal, brethren. It's, ba it's not Baptist. It's not Pentecostal. It's Bible. <laughs> All right. Now, there's a, before we turn to the Scripture, there's a couple of things in life that, um, that we work on, that we have to deal with. Uh, one of those things is consistency. Uh, consistency is something that all of us... Uh, ought to be working on. Some are more consistent than others. Actually, consistency is a divine attribute. God is consistent, is he not? Uh, he consistently provides. He's consistent in his righteousness. He's consistent in his holiness. Everything about God is consistent. He is never inconsistent. So when we think about consistency in life, consistency is something that we all should be striving to work at. Sometimes we stumble here and there and we get a little bit inconsistent with certain things, but like God being consistent, we should be consistent in many, many of the basics, by the way. Uh, we ought to be consistent in our prayer life, Bible reading. We ought to be consistent in our witnessing. Um, so consistency is something that is important for us to think about. The other thing that we deal with is, is at, in times of life when we feel that we're in a rut, 
Anyone ever felt at times they've been in a rut? They've been, you know what I mean? Like you get to a point in your life where you just, I feel bored. Being in a rut means you're bored with the same thing. Another word for consistency is routine. Sometimes when you're in a routine, you feel like you're in a rut. And uh, you, you just, you, you aren't happy about that. You, you feel like you're in a rut with your job or in a rut with uh, schooling or, you know, higher education or whatever it is. You just feel it. The danger of being in a rut is trying to get out of that rut by your own means. You look for something that will help you to get out of that. And sometimes what we look at in getting out of that rut leads us to bigger problems. Uh, sometimes we might feel like we're in a rut when it comes to when it comes to church. You know, is uh, there's the same routine perhaps, and there's the same way that we do things. And I think there are times where we should freshen it up and maybe mix it up a little bit. But you don't want to think that you're in a rut when it comes to worship and think, okay, we're in a rut. I feel bored, especially from a pastor's perspective. I feel I feel like we're in a rut. We're bored. Uh, you know, we're singing the same songs. Let's try and let's try and incorporate something to help us get out of this rut. It's a very dangerous place to be in. We want to not mistake consistency for being a rut. But what happens when? consistency is viewed as a rut all we're being is consistent in life or we've got our routine we you know oftentimes uh it, we hear it said in our house it's like oh the weekend goes by so quick and next thing i know i'm i'm going to bed for monday and i get up in the morning and have breakfast i go to work i come home i have a meal i go to bed i get up in the morning and and there's that routine that we all have but sometimes we feel like we're in a rut. What happens when consistency is viewed as a rut? What happens when the consistency of God in our life is viewed as a rut? You say, surely that can't happen. Well, let's go to Numbers chapter 11 because I really do believe that where Israel is at at this particular time in their life, they are viewing the consistency of their life the consistency of what God is doing. They feel that they're in a rut. They're bored, if you please, with the status quo of life. All right, They're bored with what's taking place. Let's look at chapter 11, Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. It says this, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, uh, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat freely in, uh, sorry, we, let me read that again. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof is the color of bellium and the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in a pan and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. As we look at this subject this morning, I do pray that you would help us. Uh, Lord, help us to view things rightly. We don't want to get bored with your consistency. Uh, Lord, we want to embrace it. We want to fellowship and enjoy it. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd fill us all with your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before we uh, look at this, we need to go back to chapter 10 for a moment and see where it all begins. And I want you to go to chapter 10 and verse number 29. Chapter 10 and verse number 29. Uh, we know the backstop of all of this where God had led his people out of Egypt and uh, he's leading them by the way and, 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 it call, and it's known as a journeying. And verse number 29, it says this, And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it you. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good, for the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. So here we see Moses saying to his father, We're journeying unto a place 
uh, that God has given us, that God has said, here it is, we know that that place is the land of Canaan, they're journeying towards that, journeying to the place that God has given them. Now, what I find interesting about that is that when you look at that and you look at our lives, we too are journeying to a place. The place that God has given us is heaven. So we're going on a journey as well. And if you notice what Moses is saying to his father-in-law, he invites him to come along on the journey with him. It's important for us to understand as we journey through life that we invite people to come on the journey with us. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? When was the last... Friday. You're good this morning. When was the last time that you took one of the gospel tracks up on the back table and just gave someone a gospel track and, and, and invited them perhaps to receive Christ? Come on the journey with me. This is what Moses was saying. If we all believe that we're journeying to a place that God has given us and that place is heaven, then we ought to be inviting people along the way. Amen? That's what I enjoyed about yesterday. I haven't door knocked for a while. Uh, we've letterboxed, but we used to uh, door knock quite a lot when we were up in the sunny coast there at Heritage. And yesterday, I really, well, actually during the week, I really sensed the Lord saying to me about getting back into that again. And so uh, grateful that Michael was with us uh, yesterday. And uh, Cameron, of course, was in the car praying. He couldn't walk. His, his uh, ankle was still swollen up. But it was good just to get out into the community and knock on some doors. And I tell you why it's a good thing to knock on doors. And I understand that not everybody uh, likes that because it's a very daunting thing to go up to a stranger's house, knock on the door, and you don't know the person, you don't know what's behind the door, you don't know what's going to go on. And so you, you encounter all sorts. But I tell you what's good for believers, for churches to get out into the community, you get to know who's in your community. You, you get to see you get to see those who are struggling. You get to see those who are, uh, are hopeless, uh, without Christ. Uh, you get to see those who 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 oh, I'm right, mate. I've got my own religion or whatever it is. It's important that the church of the Lord go out into its community. Yes, letterbox, that's fine. But we ought to be talking to people and trying to invite people on the journey to the place that God has given us. Uh, I want to challenge you this week. Take five, take five gospel tracks and challenge yourself to at least just hand one out a day. Let me invite you. Don't have to go into a big spiel. You don't have to if you don't know what to say. Just say, "Hey, I'm from Open Door Bible Church. Can I give you this? This is some good news. Uh, I want to invite you along to the church. I want to invite you to read this. Whatever. Just get it out there. Invite people on the journey." And again, we were out yesterday, and you, we come across all sorts. Uh, wow, we come across some really shady characters. And uh, twice yesterday, twice, Cameron and I were parked over here. I backed up there and we're just waiting for Michael to turn up. And then all of a sudden we see a little yellow car drive from behind the building here, come through here and pulled up next to us, opened the door and said, oh, are you cousin such and such? I went, no. And they said, are you detectives? <laughs> oh, I could have had some fun with that. I could have got my wallet out and I could have said, uh, I could have gone like that, you know what I mean? But they were, it's like, why are you asking if we're detectives? What were you doing back here, right? But then we we're out door knocking and because Michael's very tall, right? He's very tall. I'm so glad he was with me. He's my bodyguard. And, uh, and the, the, second, the third door we knocked on, I think it was John and, and Vanessa, he was asked the question if he was a policeman. <laughs> and uh, it's like, wow. And I, I think the guys next door are really concerned as well because they just looked like your typical drug runners, you know what I mean? And, but we had a great time walking down the street and, and we were fellowshipping, but we were there inviting people to the Lord. We, we were trying to witness, we were trying to, you know, we're using John 3.16, a very simple verse and letting people know that God loves them and uh, God sent his son Jesus as a gift and you've got to believe in Jesus. You can't believe in a system, a religious system. You can't, the Baptists won't save you. The Roman Catholics won't save you. Only Jesus can save you. You've got to believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you'll perish. And, and I said, that's the horrible part of it. You'll go to hell. But if you receive Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. That's good news. And that's what we're trying to tell. But as we journey life, we need to invite people along the journey with us. But also when we journey through this life to the place where God has for us, we do tend to complain and murmur a little bit, don't we? 
Thank you, Metro. I appreciate that. <laughs> everyone, everyone should have went, mmm, yes. We all, we all have the tendency to murmur and complain, and these folks were no different, right? Look at chapter 11, verse number 1. And when the people complained, when the people complained... It's very easy. As a matter of fact, we won't turn there, but in the book of Jude, verse number 16, one of the end times attitudes of people is murmuring and complaining. There's a lot of murmuring and complaining. You actually don't have to look too far to find a lot of murmurers and complainers out there. Unsaved people are murmuring and complaining about the government and about the situation in life. And then we've got Christian people also that are looking at what's going on and murmuring and complaining because of what's happening, what's taken place. But we as believers have got to look at what's going on in the light of the Scripture and say, hey, everything that's taken place is for our good because Jesus Christ is coming back. So instead of us murmuring and complaining, we ought to be rejoicing and thanking God. But we all fall in the trap, don't we? of murmuring and complaining, and it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. So we've got this journeying that we're on, and I'm going somewhere, so stay with me, but I want you to look at the influence. Look at verse number four. It says this, The mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? The mixed multitude. Who are the, the mixed multitude? Well, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, we know that when Pharaoh finally let the children of Israel go, there was a mixed multitude that came out with them. Uh, They may have been from other nations that Egypt had brought in and used as slaves. They could have been Egyptians themselves that were just looking for an out. They were probably fed up with Pharaoh and what things were going on with. And they think, wow, these people are going, I'm going with them. It doesn't matter. There was a mixed multitude that came out with them. But I want you to notice something very important. The mixed multitude were not more than the children of Israel. The children of Israel were more than the mixed multitude, but we often see the influence of a minority group affecting the majority. We've got to be so careful who we mix with. So very careful today as believers who we mix with. Isn't it interesting in the world today we see a number of minority groups that are influencing the, 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 the nation. You see the LGBTQI crowd, are they a minority group? They are a minority group. And who's got the loudest voice? Who's got the biggest influence? They do. They do. Uh, How many many of us know that road rules change because of a few people that don't know how to drive the car and they have accidents and so on and so forth and the uh, the minority affect the majority? Insurances go up because there's people that can't drive properly and they have accidents left, right and centre and then we're all lumped in and have to pay higher insurances and all this. Why? Because there's just a few that just can't do it. And so the majority is affected by the few. And same here, the influence is amazing, the mixed multitude. We've got to be so very careful about the mixed multitude. We've got to be careful about who we allow uh, 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 who we allow to influence us. I want to go to a uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter twenty-two. I want to give you a principle this morning in regards to this Deuteronomy twenty-two. Deuteronomy twenty-two. This is not listen. This is not a, a, a favourite subject amongst Christians today, and it's the subject of separation. Do you know when you were got saved, you were sanctified, and the term sanctified means to be set apart. All right, you're set apart for His use. So when we think about the, 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 the doctrine, if you please, of separation and the principle that we look at here, it's not, really, uh, it's not really something that is heavily taught today or preached. And, and the reason being is because in the majority of churches today, there is a mixed multitude. There's a mixed multitude. Have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Look at this principle here. Uh, it says in verse number 10, Thou shalt not plough with an ox and an ass together. Now, you might read that and think, well, that's okay. We don't have to worry about that. We don't use that anymore. I don't certainly plough with an ox or an ass anymore. You know what I mean? I, and, and we're in danger of sort of scooting over this, but there is a principle in this verse here, and it's the principle of compatibility. The ox and the ass are both beasts of burden. They, they both plough. They both do the same thing. But in the yoke, which is a picture of labour, in the yoke they are not compatible one with the other. And so God says, you can't plough with, with an ox and an ass together. You've got to have two oxen or you've got to have two asses. What, you can't have both. You can't, because they are not compatible. 
They're not compatible. Now, let me, let me say this. Uh, I mentioned this during the week, and, and, and I hope you're not offended by this, but uh, some, some of us might know, you might, know, not, might not know this guy, Greg Locke. Uh, Pastor Greg Locke was an independent fundamental Baptist evangelist at one time, and he would travel America, very good preacher. Uh, he would travel America, and, uh, and he would preach, and then one day he decided to go into the pastor, and he started uh, uh, Global Vision Baptist Church, changed the name to Global Vision Bible Church, and then started off on a journey of entertaining and adopting charismatic practices. Okay, uh, and so it's like, okay, well, that's you know, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But then, then he he was told that God told him to start building bridges. Building bridges is a very, very popular phrase amongst evangelicals today. We want to build bridges. Nowhere in the Bible do you see us building bridges. What you do see is building walls. And a wall is a wall for protection. And so here's Greg Locke. God says to him, I want you to start building bridges. And now he's built a bridge to Benny Hinn. Who knows who Benny Hinn is? Benny Hinn is part of the Word of Faith movement and uh, he's the guy that uh, if you watch, uh, you watch YouTube or whatever it is and, and he does a, a number of crazy things, he, he'll stand there and he'll blow out and everyone falls back or he's got people that come up on the stage and he gets his phone and he'll go like that and he'll go like that and they'll all fall over in the spirit and all this sort of stuff. I tell you what's funny, when you watch that to the soundtrack and to the music of Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Yeah, that's good. And they're all getting slain, they're all getting bitten, all this sort of stuff. That's the danger of building bridges. You see, an ox and an ass can't plow together. Now, I'm going to leave it up to you when it comes to Greg Locke and Benny Hinn, who's the ox and who's the ass. I'll leave it up to you. Thinking, thinking, thinking. thinking. Maybe they're both compatible because they're both asses, maybe. Who knows? But we've got to be careful. So here we've got this principle here about not plowing or, or not being compatible. Let me, just, let me just say this. Now, you might not like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Baptists are not compatible with Pentecostals. Baptists are not compatible with Presbyterians. You say, that's a bit harsh. Shouldn't we be loving everyone? I'm not saying not loving. I'm talking about yoking up. Why wouldn't I want to yoke up with the Presbyterians? Because they believe that you can lose your salvation. They believe that in Calvinism and they believe in infant baptism and they believe in doctrinal things that I don't hold to personally as a preacher. Why wouldn't I want to yoke up with the Pentecostal? I tell you what, there's some very sincere and loving Pentecostal people out there. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. But they believe you can lose your salvation. They believe in speaking in tongues. They believe in a lot of different practices, extra biblical practices that I don't believe in. As a matter of fact, I don't think they're very well grounded scripturally speaking. So I am not compatible with that. Okay? So we've got to be very careful. And it sounds very mean, doesn't it? But it's not the reason why you can't plough with an ox and an ass. Because if you put an ox and an ass together, you're heading for trouble. They're not compatible. They'll fight with each other in the yoke and the ox will try and fuel the ass and vice versa. And there's just, you're not going to get anything done. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, there is a one world religion coming, isn't there? Yeah. And it's already in the makings. And I tell you, this is just my opinion. And I'm letting you know this is my opinion, right? This is just my opinion. My opinion is this, is that God is going to use the charismatic Pentecostal movement to help usher in the one world religion. And the reason why I say that is the danger of the Pentecostal charismatic, though there's some good brethren in there, the danger of that is that they cross denominational lines. Mm. You've got Mormons speaking in tongues now, Roman Catholics speaking in tongues. You've got every man and his dog out there where there's the influence of charismatic and Pentecostalism, where they're all speaking in tongues and all this sort of stuff. Don't tell me that they're not crossing denominational lines. Yeah. And so you've got to be so careful about a mixed multitude. This is why, and I know this is doctrine, and I'm not going to chase this, but this is why baptism and the Lord's Supper is very important. And I'll tell you why. Because baptism and the Lord's Supper are like the porters of the Old Testament. The porters in the Old Testament were there to guard the door, and they allowed in certain people, and they stopped certain people. And the Lord's Supper and baptism really are the porters of the New Testament. 
Because once a church starts entertaining a mixed multitude, then we're like, let's do this and let's do that and how about this and how about that and, yeah. and we've got banner worship up the back and we've got people twirling stuff around and yeah. we've got all sorts going on and, and, and it's not done decently and in order. But hey, we've accommodated. And in order to be compatible, you must compromise. Yeah. You've got to compromise. If I want to be compatible, if I as a pastor or we as a church want to yoke up together with, with a charismatic church, we've got to compromise on some things, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, you're looking at a guy that's, that's I'm not willing to compromise. No. Right. I'm really not willing. We were talking about this on the road yesterday, our door knocking is so we are losing a generation of young people today. Mm. We've already lost some. Yeah. And we're losing them to churches that have a, yeah. uh, a, a a view of life and excitement and so on, and then they, yeah. they view some independent Baptist churches and, and they see the, the they see the dull and the boring and whatever it is, and they think that life is better over there instead of here. But what are they doing? They're sacrificing spiritual life for the flesh. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So what's the answer? As independent, fundamental people, Bible-believing people, our song service can still be upbeat and encouraging and exciting yeah. without having to compromise. Mm, right. And what's more important in the house of God anyway? Is it the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth? Yeah. Right. Pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. Give myself an amen right there. Right. <laughs> I might listen to the message over again and just get yeah. excited about it. Amen. Yes. <laughs> that is so true, though. That is, that is such a big thing out there with the doctrines and things yeah. going on. Because yep. I've seen it myself in so many churches, and that's where all the structure's all gone. Yep. And the pastor gets caught up in it, and he, he there's no truth, and there's no spiritual instruction and righteousness because everyone says this is how it should be. And you've got a big mixed multitude of all sorts. Yep. And then where is the real seed? Yep. Because that's why the Lord is going to have to filter. He's got to filter everyone because what happens is, oh, they I know this and I know more than you, and I, my Jesus is better than your Jesus. And so you get one big mixture, and I saw it so much time. I said, Lord, where are these people going? And where is the real thing? Who's got the real deal? That's what I got this week. It was very, very, very strong in my spirit. Who's got the real deal? Who's walking in the spirit? And who's walking in the truth? And who's walking really for God? Amen. All right, let's get back to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. So here we see the children of Israel now, they're being influenced and now they're starting to get bored. They're starting to cry out. They're starting to complain. They're murmuring. They're being influenced. Now look at the criticism or the critical attitude that they develop because of that. You know, they're remembering the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. They remembered the fish, but they forgot about the taskmasters. They, they forgot about their treatment. They forgot about how cruelly they were treated. But hey, they were, they were remembering the fish. They were, what we were eating. Look at that. Oh, the cucumbers. I don't know why they're excited about cucumbers and, <laughs> and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. Onions and garlic may be pretty good if you've got a cold, right? But man, they're, they're just excited over this vegetarian diet right here. You know what I mean? But they forgot what they were experiencing. But now look at what he says in verse 6. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manner before our eyes. So we see this criticism creeping in now because they are, they are viewing the consistency of God. Now check this out, the consistency of God and they feel like they're in a rut. We're missing out on so many things here. Let's go back to Egypt. We remember what Egypt was all about. So you become critical. Our soul is dried up. Look at chapter 11. Look at verse number 31. It says this, And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them all... Uh, sorry, let them fall by the camp as it was a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the earth. So in other words, God's like, okay, I hear this. I'm sending the quails and uh, man, there was quail everywhere. Woo, this is really good. Now we've got some meat. We've got some quail. Anyone eaten quail before? I mean, there's really not much to a quail, right? It's, I mean, they're the smallest of all kinds of birds, but they were so excited. Now just gathering all these quails and it says that as they began to eat it, it went rotten in their mouth. And they vomited it all out. Now, I want you to go, hold your place here in Numbers 11. I want you to go to Psalm 106 with me. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Look at 
Look at Psalm 106. Look at verse number 15. 14 and 15. He says, They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Now watch this. And God gave them their request, but watch this, sent leanness into their soul. Sent leanness into their soul. These people were willing to give up the fatness of their soul, fatness being spiritually speaking, just for a fleshly appetite. How many people are willing to give up their spiritual growth just to appease the flesh? May God help us not to get fed up with the consistency of what God is doing in your life or the life of this church. May we not look at that and think, oh man, man, it's been like this for so long and I just feel like we're in a rut. Let's just change some things. No, let's just thank God for his consistency in our life. And let's not view his consistency as being in a rut. They despise God's miracle. Who, who would have thought that they would despise God's miracle of manna being delivered every day? But they were despising that. I want you to hold your place in, in Numbers 11. I want you to go to John chapter 6 for a minute. John chapter 6. I was here during the week in devotions. It's a great chapter dealing with bread. He, Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. And, uh, you know, it, it's on the back of this amazing miracle where Jesus fed 5,000. Now, that's a miracle and a half, right? I mean, we think it's a miracle to feed a big family and, and whatever. But here Jesus is feeding 5,000 people. He feeds them with the, with the loaves and the fishes. And it's something to behold. But listen to what Jesus says in regards to this in verse number 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not... Because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now, you know what Jesus is saying there? Because we are often steered away from this. We are often steered away from uh, seeking God for the miracle or seeking God for the supernatural because you often hear it says, well, miracles don't produce faith and, and so on and so forth. Do you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is lamenting here because there were people that were only following him to have their flesh filled and they weren't seeking him because of the miracles. What should we be seeking Jesus for then? We ought to be seeking him for the supernatural. Is he not a supernatural God? And so therefore, when you think about what Jesus is saying here, we ought to be seeking him because of what he's able to do. Yes, we seek him for who he is and we love him for who he is and he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and, and all of that. But don't, don't take that and throw away the seeking because he is a miracle working God. He's not ceased from doing amazing things in your life or my life or the life of this church. And so Jesus wants us, I believe, he wants us to seek him because of the miracles. Look at verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth. That's the loaves that he's talking about. That's the fleshly things. But he says, labor for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Isn't, isn't, a, isn't the winning of a soul a miracle? People getting saved is just as much a miracle as someone who gets physically healed or emotionally healed or whatever it is. And, and, and more often than not, you've got different camps and, and one camp might lean more towards this and the other lean towards that. I want to be balanced in our approach. Let's just seek God for the miracle, the miracle of people getting saved, the miracle of people getting delivered, the miracle of, of whatever Jesus is able to do. We've got a Bible that tells us what Jesus can do. Let's seek him for those things. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 11. It's hard to imagine that the children of Israel were getting fed up with the miracle, the daily provision. Every day God was consistent in providing the manna. Every day. And then when it came to Friday, he doubled up because they weren't allowed to go out on the Saturday and get it. And if they took too much, it went off. It went rotten. God, God knows exactly how much to provide. And they got fed up with that. They got critical about that. But notice, I want you to notice the experience for a moment. And I want you to look at verse number 8. And it says this, The people went about and gathered it, this is the manna, and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. So what's he saying there? Well, let me just say this. When you taste something, it's an experience. Okay? 
Where's Robert? What did you make for Megan the other day? Cheesecake. Yeah, what was that cheesecake? Biscoff. A bisc- I don't know what Biscoff is, but it's a biscuit apparently. So he, for, for Megan's birthday, he makes this Biscoff cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to lose weight. Emphasis on the trying, right? And so he yells out, right, anybody who wants a piece, you can have it. And you could hear the rush and... And I'm like, should I or shouldn't I? I should. So I cut myself, a, I gave myself an injection first because I wanted to make sure that, <laughs> that the insulin matched up with what I was going to eat, you know. <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord for insulin. Anyway, I had a slice of this cheesecake. Oh, the experience was so good. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, Blair, young Blair rang us, I rang him during the week and uh, when I rang Blair, which is Carol's grandson, he was crying. What are you crying about? And his mum said he misses Nana Tracy's sticky date pudding. And he had that that last time we had a lunch here, this is weeks ago. And he's just remembering it. He he started being all emotional about this sticky date pudding. But when you eat a sticky date pudding, that's an experience and a half, is it not? And so mum's made him one. I think mum's already made him one to, to appease him. But eating is an experience. And now what God is saying, when he says in Psalm 34, O taste and see that the Lord is good, you know what he's saying? I want you to experience my goodness. Christianity is an experience with a living God. I won't, I won't stand for, for boring, liturgical kind of meetings and services. God is real. God is alive. And God is able. And we ought to experience the living God in our life. Yes. I taste, experience and see that I am good. And what he's saying here is, he said, the taste of this manner, the experience of this manner was like fresh oil. And that's significant. David said this in Psalm 92, he said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Fresh oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. They were criticizing and despising the experience of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this, you know, God wants you to experience his spirit. Now, if he provided every day the manna, and every day when they ate the manna, the taste of that was a fresh oil. Every day, folks, Ephesians 5.18, and be not drunk with wine or excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let me ask you a very personal question. Don't shout it out. I want you to think about it. When was the last time you were, you were filled with the Spirit? When was the last time you were filled with the Spirit? Because just because you were born again, it doesn't mean that you're filled with the Spirit. In John chapter 20, in verse number 22, Jesus stood before the disciples. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. What did they receive? Did they receive the Holy Spirit? Of course they did. Then why did he tell them, you know, you tarry in Jerusalem for 10 days until you're filled with the Spirit? Because the fullness of the Spirit is separate from being born again and sealed with the Spirit. The problem that we have in Christianity today is that we don't have enough Spirit-filled believers. And so when there's no spirit fullness in the church and we feel like we're in a rut, do you know what we do? We seek other things. We seek other things to try and represent life. And life comes through the spirit of God, which he wants you to be filled with. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste of it. And the taste was of fresh oil. And brethren, we ought to be filled with the spirit every day of the week. I want you to go to Zechariah and we'll finish here. Zechariah. I love the subject. I really do. I love the subject. You know, one of the things that should be taught regularly or preached regularly is the spirit-filled life. I really believe that. I'm not talking about going to seed on it, but I do think living the spirit-filled life is important for the Christian life. By the way, let me just say this. Being filled with the spirit is an experience of itself. The problem is, is that there are some who say, well, 
the experience of that or the outworking of that is that the tongues that they say, right? Now, I don't believe in Pentecostal tongues. I'm just putting that out there. You're looking at a guy that does not believe in the charismatic interpretation of what tongues is. Tongues, according to the scripture, is a known foreign language that the Spirit of God gave people an opportunity to speak and they heard what they speak and they got saved, all right? But there are some that will make this statement. Have you been filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Jesus never said that to start with. When Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they're endued or filled with the Holy Ghost, that was what he was experiencing. He wanted them to experience the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to preach the gospel. Brethren, let me tell you, there is a power associated with the Spirit that there are too many Christians who have not experienced that. Many, many years ago, the old timers would would tarry. They would tarry on the Lord. They would wait in prayer until they were filled with the Spirit. Now, let me just say this, and I'm not going to, I won't turn to the scripture, but it says, and be not drunk with wine, whereas excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is also likened as wine. So if you were to go over into Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 23 where it talks about, you know, they, they that tarry long at the wine, they get drunk, right? But if you were to take both Ephesians 5.18 and that passage in Proverbs, people who get drunk and get silly and fall over, they get that way because they tarry long at the wine. If we would tarry long to be filled with the Spirit, there would be a change in our life too. There would be a different walk, there would be a different talk, there would be a different attitude because the Spirit of God is controlling us. Not being controlled by some fleshly thing. Okay, So the children of Israel, they, they were grieved and they were despising because they're like, oh, this manner, oh, you know, the consistency of God, this, oh, we want the leeks and the garlics and we want the onions and we want the fish and all this sort of stuff. And, and God's like, okay, here it is. But then they get leanness to their soul. And they, they overlooked the taste and the experience of the manna, which was like fresh oil, and they wanted the flesh. Have a look at Zechariah chapter 4. Verse number six, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Anything that's going to get done in your life of any significance in the life of this church, of any significance, is going to be done because of the Spirit of God. You get the Spirit of God when you get saved, when you ask Christ to save you, you are indwelt with the Spirit, you're sealed with the Spirit, that's when you receive the Spirit. But to be filled with the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit can come at a separate time in your life, not necessarily at salvation. It can happen at salvation where you get saved and filled at the same time, but more often than not, you get filled at a later date when you understand it a little bit more. And then he goes on and, and talks about the foundation. They say, any work of God, it basically is what he's saying in this chapter, any work of God is going to be done by the fullness of the Spirit. So we have uh, in our life, are we, going to, are we going to look at the consistency of God and think, wow, we're just in a rut? All right, we're going to view the consistency like we're in a rut, or we're going to rejoice at the consistency of God in our life? He's consistent in your life. He's never inconsistent. He's always consistent. And, and, and I feel that we've enjoyed as a church for a long time now the blessing of the Lord, the consistency of God, the, the rejoicing, the services, uh, uh, people visiting and thank you for visiting and it's good to have you with us today and all that sort of stuff. But only God can do that. Amen. Only God can do that. And we ought to rejoice in his consistency and not feel like, man, I'm in a rut. If you're in a rut, the problem's not with God. The problem's yourself. It's me. I get bored, I get bored very easy. I like to be busy all the time. I, I don't like having holidays, to be honest with you, because I, I like to be on the go all the time. It annoys my wife no end when I've got nothing to do. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Thank you for the word. We pray that you would, we would take it to heart. And Lord, we thank you for your being consistent in our life. Lord, we thank you for the outpouring of your spirit.
Thank you for the work of the Spirit in our life. And Lord, I do pray, Father, perhaps there are some that feel like they're in a rut in life. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you'd lead them and guide them and help them to see that the consistency of our God in our life is just amazing. May we always rejoice in that. And so we thank and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Michael.